<laughs> I'm really delighted that so many of you have come this evening um, to listen to me talk about uh, the history of the university. It's really, uh, I find it really inspiring actually that um, our history attracts uh, so much interest amongst our alumni and friends. This evening I'm going to be talking about the university's history through its historic built environment um, but with one big caveat which is that the university has a very diverse history, it finds its origins in uh, multiple institutions and we have and have had um, many hundreds of buildings so obviously um, so that I don't keep you here until tomorrow afternoon um, I'm only talking about a, a small proportion of them. Since we're in um, this evening spaces that were created either for Owens College or the Victoria University, that's where I'm going to focus, um, so that we're surrounded by some of the architecture that was created. Um, and so alongside talking about uh, the buildings that were created, I'm also going to talk about the, the hist historical narrative that's kind of running alongside their creation. So for those of you who um, aren't that familiar with the history of the university, uh, we have this kind of family tree, which I think is in a booklet that you might have yeah, on the um, inside page, if you can't see here. Essentially, what it's demonstrating is that the university today finds its origins in three main areas. First, on the left, um, the medical schools. Um, on the right, the Manchester Mechanics Institute, institution, which became UMIST. And then highlighted in the centre, um, Owens College, which became the Victoria University. Rather than just talking chronologically, um, I'm going to talk um, about the buildings through three main themes. Firstly, um, the origins and early development of Owens College and then the Victoria University. Secondly, about the practicalities and some of the symbolism that the architect um, tried to invest in the buildings. And then finally, about some of those specialised spaces um, that were created for... Owens College and the University, uh, the Victoria University, that made it quite different from um, some of its contemporaries. Most of what I'm going to show you is based on um, my own recent or relatively recent archival research, both here in the University Archive and in archives in London, especially the Royal Institute of British Architects. And I've been doing that for two reasons. Firstly, um, I'm just finishing writing a paper for a journal article, uh, for a journal, sorry. Um, about our 19th century medical schools, which are on Coupland Street, um, talking about how we can see changes in the practice of medicine, but more importantly, the, um, the teaching of medicine um, through the architectural spaces that were created for them. Um, second, I've also been looking at these Waterhouse buildings, um, partly because, um, as Claire mentioned, we have uh, heritage tours around the university, and we're trying to launch tours to go inside our buildings. So one of the reasons we've been uh, doing this research is that we know more about the building so that we can give a better experience to visitors when they come. Um, it's also important for us because we've committed to caring for our historic spaces above and beyond um, Historic England's listing system um, so that we maintain um, spaces in such a way that you can still read their in original purpose if we can, like this and then also my own sort of personal research projects. So we'll start then with the growth and development of um, the institution. Of course, we start here um, with Owens College, which is an early sketch of um, Owens College's first building on Key Street um, in 1851. Owens College gets its name from, from this chap, uh, John Owens, who was um, a merchant, uh, manufacturer, and later in his life, a bit of a um, financial speculator um, who left around £96,000 um, in his time, about £10 million uh, with inflation in today's money. And, and I'll, I'll quote you what he wanted to do. He wanted to create um, and to provide youths of age 14 and upwards instruction in the branches of education taught at English universities, importantly free from religious tests. Whilst there had been interest in um, establishing a university college in Manchester before this, um, there was, of course, no <coughs> university college in Manchester at the time. 
and really only one um, in the north in its entirety. English higher education in the middle of the 19th century was uh, dominated by the ancient universities of Oxford and Cambridge and their particular approach to education. There were also some new starters. There was University College London, King's College also in London, and Durham, um, obviously just near Newcastle. Importantly, um, University College London was the only institution that shared with Owens College um, no religious affiliation. Um, so Owens College and UCL, you could be admitted whether you were um, non-conformist, Catholic, Jewish, whatever, whereas everywhere else uh, you had to um, adhere to the Church of England to be admitted. And that was important for Manchester's population, um, which, was large, which had a large percentage of non-conformists. And so I think it's important to think about the, the type of city that Owens College opened up in. Um, as I say, it had a large non-conformist population, but of course it was also uh, the world's first industrial city. Um, as it saw its economy and the economy of the surrounding region move from being dominated by human and animal power and small-scale production to utilising uh, fossil fuels and hydropower for mass production. I did this very kind of unscientific attempt to map some of the industrial and manufacturing sites um, of Manchester, essentially where all the red dots are, is where there was a manufacturing or industrial site in Manchester in 1851. This is the kind of the western side of the city. <clears throat> so you can see where the, the present town hall is uh, just there. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully what it reveals is that there were, in the city centre, uh, a lot of industrial and manufacturing sites, along with you know, some of the infrastructure um, of um, industry. The transition of the economy um, saw huge numbers of people moving into Manchester. So people from rural areas moving into cities in a very similar way to the brick economies, so-called um, Brazil, Russia, India and China, where large volumes of people moving from rural areas into um, city centres. The result was, uh, quite famously, quite a chaotic um, and dirty scene, <laughs> um, famously described by Engels um, in his work on the English working classes. Um, so amongst the um, high density of housing, um, there was all of the um, activity of the economy, um, all sorts of squeezed into a relatively small space, and that's why Manchester became known as the city of cellar dwellers, because there were so many people living in um, basements or cellars. Um, I've got a quote from a publication called The Graphic, which was quite a popular publication in the mid to late uh, 19th century. It's called The Graphic because it always had pictures. But it gives you, um, it gave uh, a description of the city almost like the Lonely Planet Guide would today. Um, and I thought it kind of sums up what Manchester was like um, actually slightly after Owens College opened. <clears throat> so this is its opening um, kind of paragraph from its description. It says, it must be confessed that the approach to Manchester, from whichever way the traveller comes, is hardly likely to convey a favourable impression of the capital of the north. Should he arrive from, from London, four routes are open to him, all of which unite at Stockport or near to it, and convey him over four miles or so of the dreariest countryside in England. On either side, is a low, long expanse of field, fields traversed by cinder paths, paths, that is to say, with clinkers um, from factory furnaces and dotted with mills, weaving sheds and cottages for the hands. As the traveller approaches the end of the journey, the houses grow thicker, the chimneys more numerous and the atmosphere denser. Much the same impression, um, is received by the traveller who approaches Manchester from the north, west or south. They could have just said any other direction, but... <laughs> In each case, similar features present themselves. A spoiled country, mills and factories, ironworks and cotton pits innumerable, mean and squalid looking cottages, dirt, blackness and a curiously oppressive atmosphere. It's not until we, meet, we reach the heart of town um, that the sense of dreariness wears off. Um, 
So to Victorians, Manchester was not um, a nice place. And it kind of had this characterization of just being um, a dirty industrial site. Um, but despite this, um, and what the contemporaries kind of missed in their, their account, is that Manchester did have an active intellectual and cultural population. Um, it interested in establishing uh, an institution like Owens College. Um, so, you know, you can see in various places, oh, hang on, yes. So the blue squares um, represent some of the uh, learning and cultural institutions of the city. Um, so you've got, for example, uh, Manchester, Royal Manchester Society, uh, institution, sorry, Royal Manchester Institution, the Portico Library, uh, the Mechanics Institution, um, Public Library. Um, and so that is the, um, the city that Owens College was opening in. And this is where it opened in 1851 um, on Key Street. Uh, the building's still there. Uh, it's now a firm of solicitors, um, sort of diagonally opposite to the Opera House. Um, and it brought into this kind of melee um, a traditional form of English higher education. Um, so just going back to our map, Owens College was down here, actually not in the best kind of location. I mean, all the other um, institutions were over, over there, and it was down here in, um, uh, in the left-hand corner. And it encountered immediate problems, um, mainly due to not attracting enough fee-paying students. Part of that was based on its curriculum, which was based on, as uh, John Owens insisted, um, <coughs> the type of uh, courses taught traditionally in English universities. And the wealthy merchants and industrialists of Manchester simply weren't prepared to pay for their, for their sons, and it was their sons, excuse me, to get um, an education that focused on philosophy, the classics, etc., when they would prefer their sons to spend time learning about business, the ways of the family firm, um, or something much more applied. The change... Um, and the change in focus for the college came from this man and people like him, uh, Henry Roscoe, who was a chemist and had trained in Heidelberg in Germany under um, Robert Bunsen, as in the Bunsen burner. Um, Roscoe brought with him a more Germanic style of um, higher education and what universities were there for, which was based much more on sciences, much more on applied knowledge, and importantly, the idea that professors should research as well as teach. Um, and it was teaching predominantly that um, the professors did at Oxford and Cambridge. So essentially, we have a model of this um, institution, um, which is based on it's kind of the ideas we're familiar with today. You know, we're very familiar with the idea that uh, universities research and teach. Um, and it was breaking the mould of English higher education. With that change brought a change in its fortunes. Um, with applied scientific knowledge, um, students ha had the ability to learn um, information and knowledge that gave them an advantage, and then employers wanted them because they wanted the advantage, the scientific basis um, or other areas uh, that they had knowledge in because it gave the firms and the economy of Manchester a competitive edge. And quickly, these facilities on Key Street were cramped, they were too full, uh, but they also didn't have the right facilities uh, to, to do the type of teaching, for example, that the chemist Henry Roscoe wanted to do. Um, so we see this thing called the extension movement, which is effectively um, the college asking for public subscription or donations to purchase a larger site and uh, construct new premises. And we see somewhat of a building boom um, for the college. So we have... Um, a college which has kind of secured itself um, and based on religious tolerance um, and new ideas about what higher education was there to do, moving to this new site. And what I'm going to do is try and show you how this was manifested in the architecture. The site selected was here. Um, this is a map, um, uh, an ordnance map uh, from slightly before. Um, so the old quad is kind of built here, um, and this is Brunswick Street, um, and uh, the museum is kind of along here. Um, what you <coughs> notice is that it's actually quite a still relatively 
leafy and open part of, of town. Uh, Manchester's population, the wealthy of Manchester, always tended to move south. Um, and this area, when they purchased the site um, in 1870, was, was already beginning to change and you saw um, higher density um, uses. The architect that was commissioned by the college was Alfred Waterhouse, um, who had a strong reputation for, for producing a varied um, array of buildings um, on time and on budget. Um, he designed Manchester's new town hall and the Natural History Museum. <coughs> Building work started in 1870, and over the course of the next 30 years, the college had a huge impact um, on this area. So this is um, one of the early plans of, of the college's premises. So you've got Oxford Road down here. Um, we are sat here. You've just been over there. This is the Whitworth Hall, just so you get your bearings. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk us round um, some of these buildings around the quad um, and behind. Um, it was always intended that the college would form a quad, um, but it wasn't all constructed simultaneously because um, of a lack of funds. Um, so we get first what was called the main building, which is just there, the building that faces you as you come in through the arch, um, which was had virtually everything in apart from chemistry. Um, then we get um, the chemistry block virtually at the same time. Um, you see in there the power of Henry Roscoe um, and his interest in his own subject. And then just slightly later in 1874, um, the first medical school um, building. Then where we're sat uh, between 1887 and 1888. So you've got the Bayer building that we're sat in here. Then this is the museum. Um, then an extension to the medical school, which I'll come back to later in 1894. The Christie Library um, in 1898, and then finally the Whitworth Hall in 1902 uh, to complete the quad. So this is an illustration from 1871 um, from the builder, which was kind of like the trade press at the time. Um, and the building was designed, so this is before the construction had finished. The building was intended to be functional, yet impressive. So you can see here, it was set, up, it was set back from Oxford Road um, in a free Gothic style, which um, Waterhouse enjoyed, um, but was also by that point becoming quite a popular style for higher education buildings and continued through the um, rest of the 19th century. Here it is completed in 1876 um, with the grounds in front landscaped in a slightly more pleasant way than the current old quad car park. Um, <coughs> on the corner here, this is the, this is the chemistry lecture theatre. So if you remember on the plan, this is the sort of main building and then this is the beginning of the, um, of the chemistry block. So thinking back to the fact that this is um, a religiously tolerant institution, it's using a different model of higher education through applied knowledge and research. There's some interesting things, some interesting features and styles that Waterhouse um, put into his, his designs for the old quad buildings. Um, firstly, Waterhouse used a style that was his own and he enjoyed, uh, but also one that had been used at the colleges of, of Oxford and Cambridge. So whilst the college was behaving in a different way to Oxford and Cambridge, um, it tried to draw on the architectural styles from elsewhere to provide and project a sense of longevity, of continuity, and perhaps a more reassuring face um, of the changes it was bringing in uh, for English higher education. Um, that's also clear of what Waterhouse was trying to uh, achieve, I think, um, through the different heights of the building uh, he put around the quad, um, because they su suggest incremental development rather than buildings that were constructed over a relatively short period of, of 30 years. Uh, so here you can see the main building. This is where we are here in the Bayer building. And then the tower, which um, this is where the arch would be now. Um, 
given that it wasn't religiously affiliated, it's also curious that we see lots of ecclesiastical features, um, such as stained glass, vaulted ceilings, um, and perhaps Waterhouse was trying to give us a sense of uh, the enlightenment and betterment um, in the spaces that you know, one was expected to get in a church um, and were sort of key to Victorian identity. So here we get another perspective. So this is the Christie Library or the Christie Building, Bistro, um, the main building on the left, and then uh, where we are um, in, the, in the Bayer Building. Um, and so this is another indication of this, this, this college, or it actually become the Victoria University by this point, is that we have this huge building um, proportional to the size of the institution then, uh, which was for science. Um, and most other institutions were not doing this. They were not investing in science like this. This was for botany, zoology and, and geology. It was named after the German engineer, uh, Charles Frederick Bayer, um, who had come to England to discover kind of uh, a report back on um, English industry, um, but then ended up staying and um, created Bayer Peacock locomotives, uh, which had its manufacturing site up near Gorton. Um, Concurrently with this building, the Manchester Museum was built so the college could acquire the bankrupt um, natural history collection in the city. Um, and importantly on this slide we see here, so this is where the um, arch is now, uh, so there's two arches, um, and this space here is the council chamber. Um, but it wasn't built as the council chamber for Owens College, it was built as the council chamber for this new um, institution that Parliament had created called the Victoria University. Um, Owens College had, had been agitating for Parliament to um, agree that um, Owens College could become a university in its own right. Um, there was opposition from various different quarters and as a compromise um, it was agreed that um, an act would be passed so that um, a new federal university, a bit like the University of London, would be created which was at as a federal university for the North, and this was the Victoria University. Owens College was the first constituent college, college um, and it had one in um, Liverpool that eventually became the University of Liverpool, another in Leeds that became University of Leeds. It only lasted until 1903 uh, because of kind of civic pride and everyone wanting their own, um, own university. Then we have the Christie, uh, library, the bistro as it is now, with a, bit, with a bridge that was never completed. Um, I mean, kind of interestingly, it, it does look like the Bridge of Sighs at Oxford, but um, this was constructed, or this was designed first. Um, and then finally, the Whitworth Hall. Um, unlike all the other buildings, <coughs> this was originally designed by Alfred Waterhouse, but uh, it was finished by his son Paul, who um, perhaps controversially for family dynamics, uh, deviated from his father's design and changed it. Um, so that more or less completed the quad between 1870 and, and 1902, um, with significant symbols uh, that don't portray the reality of the institution within its walls. So by this point, 1902, the number of students had risen dramatically um, in the intervening 51 years from uh, where we started. So in 1851, when Owens College opened, it had 62 students. When this site opened, it had 495. And by, by the time um, the Whitworth Hall was finished, it had 995, so it had grown significantly. But the area around it had changed as well. If you recall that map um, from when the university or the college moved down to this site, um, it still had large open areas, but by 1893, you see it's far more densely populated um, with a real mixture of inhabitants, um, businesses, services, um, much more similar to the, the, the city centre uh, that Owens College had left 50 years or so before. This you can see is an aerial view from 1922, so you can see the remnants, this is Dover House, Dover House, yeah, um, some of the large Victorian villas that have been there, uh, there's another one there, but amongst it, sort of the growth of 
back-to-back uh, -back housing that Manchester is synonymous with, and then the university here, so we're just sat there at the moment. Um, and then some of the areas around it, so this is Brunswick Street uh, before the slum clearances, um, so this is 1905. This is uh, Chatham Street, where more or less where the Martin Harris Centre is now. Um, you can see here, this is, this is the chimney for the old medical school, for Coupland 3, if you know where that is. Um, and what's quite funny when you go into the archives, into the minutes of council, is that the people who lived along Coupland Street um, sued the university and claimed compensation because the building, from their perspective, was so huge that it blocked out their lights. Um, and the university actually had to pay out compensation. Um, and this is Eagle Street, kind of where Arthur, the Arthur Lewis building is now, um, or what some people might have known as the, um, sort of where architecture and planning were based. So the area around it had changed as well. So then, let's go and have a look inside. Um, so... We have all the plans um, for the buildings as they were originally designed. This is the ground floor um, of the John Owens building, the main building. Um, and you can see that it was the main building. You know, so you've got an engineering space here. You've got a large arts lecture theatre there. You've got natural philosophy as well as you know, administrative spaces. So this is the boardroom. Um, over the back here, this is the medical school and the... Uh, chemistry lecture theatre, uh, chemistry lab, so we'll come back to that in a minute. But this is moving on to the first floor. It's only on the first floor. Um, so far, we're, we're trying to digitise uh, the images in, in our archives so they can become um, used um, and available. But we, we only have to progress slowly because obviously um, it costs. This is the um, first floor corridor, and this is where we start to get contemporary images. So this is inside uh, John Owens on the first floor. Um, this space is relatively similar. I don't know if anyone was taught in uh, John Owens, um, but the space is virtually the same, uh, except from these busts aren't there and there's no uh, fire doors. Um, next, so this is the same plan. Um, and if you imagine the building out there, this is where the clock tower, this is where the clock is that's lit up tonight. And underneath it was the original library um, and reading room, and so we can go in there into 1897, uh, see lots of uh, good, studious uh, young men. Um, so we had the reading room here and then the library uh, back there. And then another space, um, this is now called the uh, Ken Kitchen Committee Room. Is it Committee Room? Um, and um, on the plan here, it's down as a professor's common room, but because of the uh, changing nature of the institution and the admission of women, um, it was being used um, at the end of the 19th century as the women's common room. On to the, this is the Christie um, building, the Christie Library, where the Christie Bistro is now. So this is the first floor where the, uh, where the Bistro is now. Um, and we can see what it looked like uh, before um, all these, shell these shelves are, are still there. Um, much of the portrait is still there. This is still there as the servery, but these um, have gone. And that's it in 1936, hasn't changed. This is a plan, uh, we're sat here at the moment. Uh, so this is the Bayer building and um, the, the <coughs> museum. Um, and we're just going to look in here because there's um, accounts, there's histories being written of Owens College already. Um, and of course, they were illustrated um, uh, with sketches. Uh, so this is the, the grand staircase um, and um, going up to the council chamber, sorry. So this is the space you've just been in, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Before we move on, um, <laughs> the point about those buildings, those spaces, is that they were designed to be practical. So they were large enough for the institution to double in size um, over the time that... Um, we started construction, finished construction. Um, it was also more comfortable and safe for the work that uh, was being done here. So it had central heating. Um, it was, um, all the floors were fireproofed, you know, we're doing science. Um, and so, but, so that's the practicalities, but 
let's look at how they try how Waterhouse tried to invest a sense of pride um, and identity in the institution. So this is uh, Waterhouse's design um, for a mosaic tile floor um, in the space that you've just been in. And this is symbolically at the bottom of the steps before you go up the grand staircase into the council chamber. And of course, no English institution worth its weight uh, doesn't have a coat of arms. And this is features from the coat of arms. Um, and what's interesting on, for, for me anyway, um, on all of these designs is Waterhouse's notes uh, revealing why he was doing certain things. So this is, this is a really nice one. I, I quite liked when I saw this. <laughs> um, this is, um, he, he designed a boss to sit either side of the grand staircase. Um, one at the bottom of the stairs, one at, uh, in the lobby. <clears throat> and what he reveals in his notes is that he was trying to give us a sense of the, um, the inclusive nature of the institution. So on the bottom of the steps, we have a lord and a lady. And when we reach the top, we have a commoner and a lady. So trying to give us an idea that this was not an establishment in institution. Further up the stairs, uh, or as we climb the stairs, we see Waterhouse trying to perfect his uh, Gothic style with these kind of semi-hidden um, steps. And these are all still there, by the way, so do feel free to go and have a look. Um, uh, semi-hidden steps and uh, passageways sort of appearing as you walk around. He was particularly keen on certain sculptors uh, to invest identity in spaces. And for our buildings, he used a guy called Harry Bates. Um, and so this is, this is his design, um, which sits on the tower, uh, facing out onto Oxford Road. And so here is a kind of rather again, uh, relating to ecclesiastical figures, rather saintly looking, John Owens, um, the great founder. It's almost a bit like, um, almost like a dictatorship where we've got um, Kim Jong-un sat uh, there. Um, and then into the council chamber. I don't know how many people have ever been in the council chamber. Uh, the council chamber really uh, was the board of governors of its day. And this is his design, um, but, it, Interestingly, he's got, um, he got Harry Bates to uh, produce a relief of Socrates teaching the people in Agora. Um, so linking the institution to great figures of knowledge and learning in European civilization. And here it is. Um, the relief is still there, unfortunately the fireplace isn't. Um, but all of this symbolism being invested in the building. And we see it again here. So if you've ever been to the Christie Bistro, uh, there's a stained glass window um, and the Christie building was paid for by a professor of history and political economy who later became um, a barrister, who trained as a barrister, set up uh, a very successful firm in Manchester and gave uh, this building, the Christie building, to the university along with a very significant and now very, very important collection of... Um, books, uh, 75,000 that are all in um, the John Rahner's Library on Deansgate. But what's interesting, again, is the connection with great figures. So we have Christie himself here at his, at his desk reading um, the, the tower um, of uh, the Victoria University, Manchester Cathedral. And then we have um, Erasmus is that side, the great Dutch humanist. And then somebody that... Um, Christie had great respect for, uh, which is Aldous, the Venetian scholar, um, and he, um, Christie collected his um, volumes. So we also see more of these kind of ecclesiastical features, you know, the vaulted ceilings of um, the Whitworth Hall, along with the um, uh, organ, designs for stained glass windows, and some of the stained glass in um, the John Owens building actually came from a church. And then, you can't really see this very clearly, so these, these are my pictures that I was taking in the archive, uh, but these are his designs for the vaulted ceilings and the space you've been in. As I said earlier, most of his drawings, um, and you can see they're all his drawings, this is his uh, famous signature, um, are littered with these very, very specific instructions uh, for those people who were the draftsmen who would kind of do the, the greater detail. Um, but explaining what he was trying to achieve. And we were discussing this when 
the um, AV guys were setting up, um, he paid great attention to making sure, for example, in spaces like this, that the incline was great enough so that all the students could see at any one time, but also that they had enough light to make their notes. Um, and we were just observing that the acoustics in here are good enough that I don't need to use, um, we don't need speakers, we can lecture in here without having speakers, whereas in lots of spaces that came after it, uh, that attention to detail hadn't been present, and so we've now had to retrofit them with uh, microphone and speaker systems. This is another really good example. So you've got those kind of macro ideas, or miso even, in this kind of space, uh, down to the minutiae. Um, so if you've ever been in Whitworth Hall, and if you um, are a, a, a graduate of the university, obviously you have, hopefully, for your, uh, for your ceremony. Um, but on the side of Whitworth Hall, there is a, a series of commemorative plaques for everybody. And this is him, I don't know if you can just see down here, but instructing on the particular colour that he wanted to be used. So at uh, once he was very concerned about the practicalities of the building, but also um, insisting on how it would appear. So finally, I just want to touch on um, how Waterhouse worked with scientists at the uh, college university uh, to produce specialised spaces um, the likes of which England hadn't seen before. So we saw earlier that early picture of the main building of the John Owens building and I pointed out the, the chemistry lecture theatre just kind of just on the left side. Um, and this is, the, this is the chemistry block um, and Waterhouse was commissioned not only because he produced beautiful buildings that were very practical on time and on budget but also because he was known for producing spaces that worked for scientists and listening to specialists, unlike some other members of his profession. So here we've got the uh, chemistry lecture theatre, which unfortunately is no longer there in that particular, in that particular way. Um, but it speaks volumes that there was such a large theatre dedicated to one science. And then up here, his, um, the quantitative and qualitative um, laboratories for chemistry that Roscoe designed in collaboration with, um, with Waterhouse, and here we see it. This is now student services, um, but um, this was the finest chemistry laboratory at, uh, of its time. Um, it had um, all the modern equipment that it needed, had all the services, gas, water, um, excellent ventilation and, and light um, that Roscoe and his, for his research, but also for his teaching, uh, needed. Interestingly, uh, Roscoe was later offered a chair at Oxford um, and refused to go, citing that their facilities in comparison were woefully inferior. <coughs> and then Roscoe was also very influential in the design of the medical school. During the course of the 19th century, medicine underwent a transformation um, from a discipline and profession where students were taught through an apprenticeship, apprenticeship system um, where they were indentured to a particular practitioner, learnt their particular methods, um, through to one where at the end of the 19th century you studied medicine at a university or another kind of institution of learning. You learnt um, about the human body and its diseases through the sciences that underpinned it um, and you were expected to understand and the system of medicine as opposed to it being very much based on an individual's knowledge. So this here is the original part of the medical school from 1874. If you remember when I was showing you those red blocks appearing. And then this um, is the huge 1894 extension, uh, the one that the locals complained about because it was blocking out their light. Um, and what's interesting is if we go inside, this is the 1874 building, still at this point, uh, they equipped the spaces for a more traditional approach um, to teaching medicine. So we have the anatomy lecture theatre and the dissecting room, which were absolutely at the core um, of uh, teaching medicine, um, and then the museum for specimens and samples. But then if we fast forward 20 years, we see new spaces being created in the extension, which reveal the rapid specialisation of medicine 
and the need to create bespoke spaces. And Roscoe is very influential in this, um, in this part of the building. So here we've got the uh, physiology department. Um, so labs you can't really see um, here, but uh, they're all equipped, very good light, double height space. Um, the pathology lab with lots of similarities to, to Roscoe. You can really see his trademark here with all the um, uh, services installed, lots of the latest equipment, um, you know, gas lighting and good um, daytime illumination. And then uh, another physiology lab, but this time equipped with you know, really cutting edge modern technology. We've got, a, we've got chymographs here used for measuring pressure, all powered by this pulley system, a bit reminiscent of a cotton mill, um, so that students could learn using the, the latest methods. Uh, that's been a bit of a whirlwind uh, tour. Um, but what I think is important, um, for me anyway, in looking at the architecture of the university, is that we can see evidence of how higher education in England was changing, um, and how relatively new institutions like Owens College um, were changing the nature of higher education in England. And also, really architecturally playing quite a clever game, because they were making higher education far more liberal and inclusive, and introducing new ideas about research, um, applied knowledge and the discovery of knowledge. Um, but the architectural style um, used established symbols from religion, from other educational institutions to give that sense, that reassuring sense of kudos and continuity. Thank you very much. Thank you.